All right, we're in Acts chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 19 to 30, a message entitled, A New Church and a New Name, and we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about both of those uh, here in our uh, introduction. Uh, the new church is uh, in Antioch, Syria, and it becomes uh, a very unique church because it becomes the first church where we've got actually, uh, as, uh, as God intended, as was prophesied, as Jesus mentioned, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, under the same roof and actually uh, worshiping together. A radical idea still early on in the book of Acts. Uh, the new name here is Christian. That's, uh, that's in this place that uh, believers are first called Christian. Up until then, uh, uh, again, Christianity as we know it today was another sect of Judaism known as the way. There was the, the Zealots, the Pharisees, the Essenes, and one of those sects of Judaism was the people of the way who believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the, uh, was the Messiah, also called believers, called disciples, but it's in this first place. Uh, they're actually called uh, Christians. Uh, again, this is a, a kind of a hybrid word. It's, uh, it's taken the Greek term for, uh, for uh, Messiah, Christ, uh, and then adding a Latin suffix onto it, and we come up to uh, the English version of the Christians. You see the same thing uh, done with the followers of uh, Herod in the Bible. We'll see some of them in the, uh, uh, in the next chapter. They're called Herodians in the same way. They followed, believed in, uh, be uh, trusted his precepts and, uh, and so forth. So uh, it's a term used in the New Testament era here for believers. Uh, and as far as we can tell, meant to be a derogatory term and not a, not a compliment. Uh, I think in the end, uh, maybe they took it as a compliment for someone to say that they were really a follower uh, of Christ, uh, of Jesus Christ. But I think it was given a, in a secular sense. <clears throat> see, that, <clears throat> see this for a couple of reasons. One is the fact that no Jewish believer would ever call himself uh, by the name of the Messiah or name of God or, or anything else. It would, it would never even pass from, from their lips, much less uh, uh, say that of themselves. Of the brand new believers that are that are the uh, the Greek speaking referred to here in our text as Hellenist, uh, again they're brand new babes in Christ. I don't think they would assume to call themselves by the name of their Messiah either. Uh, really, this term comes from the secular folks looking at them. Uh, really meant to be a, a derogatory term applied to them, uh, but something that uh, we all freely understand today. It doesn't quite have the same meaning, of course, because there's, uh, there's lots of people in this country that consider themselves Christians. We might call them cultural Christians. We even have to define ourselves, and when someone says, are you Christian, we actually have to add on. Uh, we're an evangelical Christian. Oh, you're one of those born-again Christians. I always think that as a compliment when the Jehovah's Witness says that to you the front door. You start sharing with them. They, they readily identify you as a born again Christian and so forth. Uh, that's not a bad thing, that's a, a good thing to be identified as someone who has a personal relationship with Christ and holds to the inerrancy of, of scripture, which uh, that term uh, identify us as. Uh, you probably should know that uh, we know from uh, our folks that are out there in the world, serving in the Muslim countries, uh, that uh, in the Muslim world, there's only three kinds of people in terms of religion. You're either Jewish, you're a Muslim, or you're a Christian. And they like to hold up to the uh, Islamic world, Christians like Madonna uh, and others, because anybody that is from the West uh, is considered uh, uh, a, a Christian. So they like to uh, hold up people like that and say, this is what Christians are like. So it's uh, certainly a term that's changed radically, may not mean what it did uh, early on here uh, in the first century. Uh, in terms of the church, uh, just to mention its, uh, its location, we've mentioned the fact that it was unique. Uh, because it had Jews and Gentiles together. And, and of course, the uh, opening paragraph is about that, how that came about. It's about 300 uh, miles north of Jerusalem, about 18, 20 miles uh, inland from the Mediterranean on the uh, Orontes River. And uh, it was a huge, huge uh, seaport town, 500,000 people, uh, which is a big city, third largest Roman city in the first century. Yes, there will be a test later. You better be writing this down. 300,000 were Roman citizens. 200,000 were slaves uh, in this city. Uh, it was known not, not only for its size, uh, but for its depravity as, uh, as well. Uh, according to Greek mythology, which they followed, you had Apollos pursuing Daphne to this city, 
uh, and in terms of their sexual escapades, that was then reenacted every night on the streets by the thousand temple prostitutes that would uh, make worship available for all, all the people that were coming through uh, that, uh, that city. So a very corrupt city in terms of sexuality and sensuality, uh, much like the, uh, the city of Corinth. Throughout the ancient world, the morals of Daphne uh, was a euphemism for actual depravity. So this is a very unlikely place for the church to begin uh, as it did, which becomes the church that is the church known for its great preaching and teaching, not just in the first century, but for the, about the first four centuries. Uh, and also it becomes the mission sending church uh, of the world. I have a, a pastor friend in Japan. He's with, he's with the Lord now. Uh, but uh, Mike Kahama, but uh, he actually, uh, you know, planted a Calvary Chapel in Tokyo uh, about the same time we did here uh, on the windward side in about 1989. And uh, he actually named the church uh, Antioch Christian Fellowship, uh, hoping that it would be a, a missions uh, uh, sending church uh, from, uh, from Japan there. Uh, I don't know that they've sent many missionaries around, but the, uh, uh, the pastor that took over after that, Santo-san, said, uh, Antioch is too hard to say in Japanese, so it's Calvary Chapel, West Tokyo, and he says, that's even too hard to say in, uh, in, uh, in Japanese, so when he answered the phone, he just says, church. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it takes more than a name uh, to be a missionary sending church uh, like this one here. Uh, again, one writer said uh, of this uh, church, God's light can shine in the darkest pit. Or as Paul put it in Romans 5.20, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So a uh, very interesting place, and what happens here is very exciting. Well, let's look at uh, the unlikely source of how this all begins. It's persecution, uh, and that's in verse 19 to 21. We would say persecution produced preachers of the gospel. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Jews only. But some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. And again, that term could, could mean uh, Jew, uh, Greek-speaking Jews, but in this case, it does actually mean Gentiles. Preaching the, the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So uh, preachers went out as a result of persecution. Certainly that becomes the story uh, of the first century church. Notice the uh, verse 19 again, a very key word. Now those who were scattered after the persecution. Luke, our writer, is, is hoping that we'll remember the fact that he's used that term in regards to persecution and what happened as a result of persecution all the way back in chapter uh, 8. Uh, there in verse 1 it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, that would be the death of Stephen, at the time of great persecution, that's our same subject here, arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all, there's our word, scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So uh, again, uh, Judea to the north, uh, Ju uh, Judea to the south, Samaria to the north, we find they, they go even further than that. Verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging out men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were, there's our word again, scattered, went everywhere preaching the word. So we're reading about the results of what happens uh, after the death of Stephen. The other thing to note here is the word preaching uh, simply means evangelize. Now, we kind of read about preaching and preachers, and we assume it's people standing behind a, a pulpit. Keep in mind, no buildings, no pulpits. Um, when they're meeting, they're meeting in small groups, they're meeting in churches. Uh, they're certainly going to synagogues uh, and using uh, that basis to preach the gospel to their Jewish audiences. But this simply means that uh, everyday folks who come to faith in Jesus Christ, who were Jewish, uh, many of them uh, having heard the gospel under the preaching of Peter in Acts 2, uh, subsequent times when uh, they're preaching there uh, in the temple area and come to faith in Christ, persecution comes. Uh, and as they went, whether they're on a sidewalk, on a boat, or in a home, they're just simply doing what came naturally to them, which was to share their faith in Jesus Christ, who he was, and what he had done for them, and what it meant to know that their sins had been completely forgiven by the grace of God. It was just the natural outflow, uh, and they're doing it. 
Now, uh, again, this becomes kind of the theme of the first century. Persecution is like you're pressing something down and it it has a tendency to to spread out. Uh, And that's happened over and over again in church history. And some of the early writers, even in the fourth or fifth century, said that uh, uh, the, the, the seeds of the gospel were planted in the blood of the martyrs. Uh, and uh, I have said uh, kind of mistakenly in the past, along with a lot of others, that anytime you have persecution, then you have growth in the church. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about an example where that's true uh, and an example in our era where it's not true. Uh, the example where it's true is in China. And uh, uh, in that country, uh, when uh, Mao Zedong took over in 1949 and began his communist rule uh, and uh, establishing an atheistic government, one of the very first things he tried to do uh, is uh, absolutely uh, wipe out the one, the one million, keep that number in mind, the one million Christians said to have been there as a result of uh, Western missionaries, beginning with men like Hudson Taylor and continuing on through uh, the work of uh, men, other men like we know, like Eric Little of uh, the Chariots of Fire uh, fame. Uh, so we have all these Western missionaries. They're able to lead a million Chinese to Christ. They are all expelled and kicked out of the country. Uh, and basically the country is shut down to, uh, uh, to the press, to any uh, uh, Western observers and so forth. Uh, and uh, missionaries that had been there, some of them for two, two uh, generations now, uh, all, had to, uh, all had to leave. Uh, what happens then is uh, during what's called the Cultural Revolution, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of Christians that are martyred. There's a lot of Christians that are uh, in prison for their faith. Uh, there's a, uh, and we've, we've met many of these folks. Uh, we've heard their stories. And, um, and if you meet a, a Chinese a Christian uh, in China today, and they're, and they're like older than 70, uh, they know what real persecution, uh, persecution uh, is. And we've... Uh, I've told the stories about the, the folks that we've traveled to China taking Bibles and who've spent uh, over 20 years uh, in prison and, uh, and uh, books about them and their uh, wonderful stories of the, the joy that they have in their hearts today, uh, those that are still around and uh, those they led to faith in Christ uh, in prison. And of course, when they return, uh, the two gentlemen we know uh, well, uh, again, both are with the Lord uh, now, but uh, their churches had grown tremendously. By the time uh, the 70s came around and uh, China determined to uh, op- open back up again to, uh, to the rest of the world uh, because of the uh, dipl- diplomatic success of a, of, a, of a guy named Richard Nixon. You may have heard of him before. Uh, but uh, he got uh, China open again, uh, talking again, uh, and so forth. And Western folks were able to get back in there once again. They found that the one million Christians had actually grown. Uh, and, uh, and we've been going there for over 20 years, uh, and the church continues to grow tremendously. Right now, there's about 100 million went from one. How do they do under persecution? There's 100 million uh, or so Christians. Some say more than that uh, in China today. Uh, and some of the guys that study missionology and uh, experts in the field, uh, and there was actually a little bit about it in the uh, national press because of a couple statements just a week or so ago. If that trend continues for another 25 years or so, uh, China will be radically changed. Some are saying even politically and possibly militarily, they will become one of the U.S.'s closest allies. Should the Lord tarry for that? Well, I don't know that we got 25 years, but should the Lord tarry, uh, that country could be radically changed because of the sheer number of Christians that are, uh, that are in that country. There's still persecution today uh, in some areas, and uh, in some areas, not so much. One Chinese pastor said that uh, persecution in China is like, um, is like a waffle, not like a pancake. This is classic Chinese, by the way. It's like a waffle, not like a pancake. He said when you pour syrup on a pancake, it flows everywhere. But when you pour syrup on a waffle, some little areas are full and some get nothing. And that's the way persecution is in China today. Some get nothing and others are very, uh, are very full. But uh, it's grown tremendously under persecution. Uh, the other example that I mentioned where that's not always true, because I used to always say that, anytime there's persecution, the church grows. But there's an, an example uh, about that that's not true. Uh, one time I wrote that on a paper in, uh, in graduate school, and my professor read ink went, this is not always true. <laughs> Here's an example where it's not true. And he wrote the, the name of the country where it wasn't true, Japan. Japan gets the gospel in the 1500s, uh, they were accepting of it uh, initially, 
Uh, they thought it would, might be good for their country and uh, for, uh, for a couple of different uh, uh, reasons. Uh, but as they watched Christianity under the guise of Roman Catholicism at that time, uh, quote, colonialized the Philippines, gained power, uh, not just uh, uh, economically, but politically. Uh, they decided, uh, the shoguns decided to shut the country off and seal it off completely. Uh, and the way that they uh, eliminated Christianity was very unique. They didn't imprison anybody. Uh, they didn't close down any churches. Uh, they didn't uh, confiscate any property. They didn't take anyone's homes. They just simply killed everybody. And they started by crucifying them, 26 of them, I think in 1527. And then, then they established what's called the five families. Five families in Japan, what they determined to do was they will link every family in every town and every vi village with five other families. If anyone in any of the five families is found to be a Christian, they will kill everyone in all five families. It has shaped the culture of Japan to this day, who are more than a little concerned about everybody else and what they think and what they think of me and, and, they, and how they watch me and what I do and what I wear and where I live and where I work and the kind of uniform my kid has on when they go to school. It all, it all derives itself from this idea of the persecution going back to the 16th century. No, the, uh, the church did not spread in, in Japan under persecution. It was virtually eliminated. There were a few secret Christians around, uh, but uh, it doesn't always hold to that form, persecution and growth. But it did in China, it's done in a lot of other places, and it has uh, certainly uh, in the uh, first three centuries of persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. Note also that uh, these are unnamed Jews from the island of Cyprus and Cyrene, again, North Africa. No official direction, no human instruction, uh, no precedent. Uh, how should we do this? Like the other guys did. What other guys would that be? Oh, yeah, this has never been done before. You can imagine the first guys are, you know, they're, you know, uh, they're a Hellenistic, Greek-speaking uh, brethren. The Jews are coming to faith in Christ. I wonder who the first guy was to go, what about the Gentile guys? They speak Greek. We could kind of share with them. What are you, nuts? Uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. How long did that argument go on before somebody shared with the first guy and he came to faith in Christ? Keep, keep in mind, we're, we're in the book of Acts here. They're not reading it. They haven't read the story about preaching, uh, Peter preaching at the house of Cornelius. They probably have no idea that that's gone down and that Peter's been called in on the carpet for it and had to explain his actions, and he was glad he took a couple of witnesses to, with him uh, to kind of back him up. Twice the number uh, normally uh, uh, needed to give testimony to support uh, the truth of what was going on. Uh, but somebody was brave enough, had enough guts, had enough courage, I had enough vision of what the gospel was all about to actually go to someone that wasn't Jewish uh, and share the gospel. Uh, and it uh, certainly changed this church and changed uh, the history uh, of the world. And none of them are named. Maybe we'll, we'll meet them in heaven. But again, these great preachers, oh, you can get their commentaries today. No, we don't even know who they are. Uh, and it's not that they were great orators or great public speakers. They were just average folks. Uh, they were just going wherever they went uh, and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and it changed the world. And that's primarily how it's always been, uh, been done. We, we thank the Lord that we can gather in, in a public setting and do what we're doing and study God's word. But uh, with or without it, without it uh, uh, God's spirit can lead and guide and direct us to share with others. Secondly, the preaching produced a, a powerful church. Notice verse 20, the phrase, preaching the Lord Jesus. This is what they were doing. Uh, they weren't out uh, establishing self-help groups and self-help clubs. They weren't telling people, you should become a Christian so you can realize the champion within uh, and, and so forth. No, they're telling them that you'll die in your sins apart from uh, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He is your only hope for uh, eternal life, and it's only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and faith in his death and resurrection that will save uh, anyone. Uh, it's not a small phrase to say they were preaching uh, the Lord Jesus. Notice the results, verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So they get uh, labeled as being Christians because of what God was doing uh, in their midst. Has this ever happened in church history since? Yeah, at least a couple of times. Uh, George Fox and his followers in 1640 reported stood before Justice Bennett and said, quote, Bid him to tremble at the word of the Lord, because they did. 
Uh, they had a tremendous fear of God and respect for his word. They trembled at the word of the Lord. And so their critics called them Quakers uh, as, as a result. Uh, later, you had the followers of uh, John Wesley, who were so meticulous and methodical in their study of God's word, uh, in their pursuit of a life of holiness. Their critics called them Methodists uh, as, as a result. Uh, and then we can kind of relate it uh, to at least the, the, the founding of Calvary Chapel in the midst of what we call the Jesus People Revival. Uh, and uh, it's funny, in one of my uh, church history books, it'll talk about the, uh, the Jesus People Revival of the 70s and uh, uh, led in part by Pastor Charles Smith. Anytime they call him Charles, you know they never met the guy. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, when that was all going on and all those uh, hippies were, uh, were being saved, uh, they were referred to as Jesus Freaks. Uh, as a result, they didn't mind. <laughs> they didn't mind. I don't. I don't think the guys here in Antioch uh, uh, minded uh, either uh, to be identified with the name of their Messiah. Uh, there's great preaching going on. Uh, there's a process of investigation that takes place in verse 22 to 24, uh, when it says, "Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch." When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many were added to the Lord. Uh, first thing about this process of investigation, we'd say done by the right man at the right, at the right time. Keep in mind what we know about Barnabas already, not even his name. Just called Barnabas because, man, the guy's just such a... Such an over-the-top encourager of other people. you got a bunch of brand-new Christians, baby Christians. They don't know scripture. They don't know anything else. Kind of rough around the edges. They grew up in that city. Uh, they grew up in that mentality. Uh, they grew up under that Greek influence and uh, the, uh, the influence of the sensuality in that city. Uh, and now they're, well, they're a couple of months old in the Lord. Uh, let's sir, send some hardline guy that's going to really crack the whip. No, let's send Mr. Encouragement himself, who will go up there and just share the grace of God and see, see what's going on in their lives. Also, uh, he probably knew a lot of the leaders already. Remember, he was a Greek-speaking Hellenistic Jew from the island of Cyprus himself. Uh, he, was the, he was the perfect guy. Uh, because of his background, he was the perfect guy because of who he was. He was a perfect guy because, well, he was so recognized by the church in Jerusalem. Barnabas goes up, comes back with a good report. All the boys back in Jerusalem, James and the boys are going to go, hey, right on. Thumbs up. That's Barnabas. Uh, so he was the perfect guy to go up there. A great, a great choice. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's certain people you want to meet in heaven one of these days, but I want to meet Barnabas. Um, this, this guy, just everything that we read about him. Uh, just to be said, he's a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. That would be an awesome thing if, you, if, we, if we get that far and you actually have, have something said about that at the, at the end of your life. What a thing to be known for, a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Uh, the process of investigation concluded that uh, Barnabas saw the evidence of the grace of God. Uh, and again, here was somebody that was able to look at and see the potential in people. Not, not where they are, were right now. Not kind of maybe the vocabulary. It's kind of a uh, big seaport town. I don't know. I don't know if there's cussing in Greek. There's really not in, in Hebrew. The worst thing you can say is, aha. Wow, that's heavy, you know. <laughs> they, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, these, these guys probably didn't sound like Christians. They probably didn't look like Christians. Uh, but uh, that's what, not what he was looking for. He wasn't looking for out, outward conformity. He was looking for a work of the Spirit uh, in, their, in their hearts. Uh, and that's what he saw here. And he was, verse 23, he was glad and encouraged them with all uh, that, uh, with purpose of heart, they should continue uh, in, in the Lord. And, uh, and again, uh, as, um, this is, it seems to be Calvary Chapel morning in terms of my, my illustration, so uh, forgive me. But uh, uh, when, when Pastor Chuck, uh, speaking of that Jesus people revival, was first approached by some young guys, uh, only weeks in the Lord, but uh, played in rock and roll bands and clubs all around Southern California and now come to faith in Christ. And they said, you know, the Lord's given us some songs. We know if we could do them at church or not. Now keep in mind, at that time, 
church was a, a piano and an organ, right? That, 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 that was it. And, um, the, uh, and so the idea of these uh, young hippie guys getting up in the middle of church and playing guitars, much less songs that they wrote, was a, a very radical thought. Chuck was suspect. So he says, okay, well, meet me Sunday afternoon here, and you guys can set up your gear. I'll, I'll hear what you got. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't want somebody else to hear it first. He said as they began to play and to sing, he, he was in the back, and he just began to weep. Because he, he knew it was the grace of God. He knew that the Lord had given him the songs. He says, these guys, they didn't know enough. They didn't know enough to write songs like these. They, they didn't know enough scripture to, uh, to write about the things they were writing about in terms of, uh, of the worship of God and so forth. He says, he, he knew it was the Lord. So he said, yeah, you guys bring your amps and your guitars and we're going to have you, we're gonna have you uh, play in church on Sunday. That, that was the beginning of something that changed the way the church I might say in the Western world, worships today. Is it unusual to walk into a church and see a band up there? It's not that unusual. Uh, it, it began because one guy, I would say another Barnabas, like Pastor Chuck, he could see the grace of God in somebody's life, forget what they look like on the outside. He was willing to look into the heart uh, and see the potential. Uh, and that's what's going on here. And that's where we need to be as well, to be able to see the potential in someone. To see the grace of God, not look on the outward, look at the age or whatever it might be. Just to be able to see uh, God doing something in somebody's life and be able to come along and to fan the flames. And that's what's happening here. Third, uh, this becomes a turning point in the church. Kind of the uh, uh, understatement, of course. Verse 25 says, And Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek a Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So uh, it was that for a whole year. Uh, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians uh, in Antioch. So, uh, again, turning point is Saul uh, coming uh, with him from Antioch. Notice verse 25 again when it says, Then Barnabas departed to uh, Tarsus to seek Saul. Uh, that, mean, uh, that word means to uh, search diligently. Now, it could have been too, uh, too hard because, uh, uh, you know, they've been face, uh, Facebook friends for several years. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the ancient world, it was really easy to look someone up. Not really. I mean, it, it, this had to be a tough task to say, I just think I'll go down there and find Saul. Oh, good. Let us know when you get hold of him. Uh, it wasn't an easy deal. Uh, he had to search diligently to, uh, to find him. Uh, now, when we last left Saul of Tarsus, you remember, he was uh, uh, the believers and the leadership in Jerusalem basically saying, I think you need to go home now because people are going to kill you if you stay here in this town. So, you know, they, they kind of usher him out and get, get him out of town. Uh, and then we went on and talked about that uh, uh, Saul would not reemerge uh, in our narrative and our story here for uh, a good eight to ten years, which is, which is the time frame here. He's about uh, 14 years old uh, in the Lord at this point. And we uh, read from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 when Paul is recounting all of his experience as a believer. You know, how many times he's been shipwrecked, how many times he's been beaten with rods, how many times and so forth. And we just can't account for it all. Uh, we see some of those things happening in the book of Acts. We have references to it in the epistles, uh, which leads us to believe that during this 8 to 10 year uh, period, Unlike what many of you are thinking, Saul was not at home watching a 50-inch flat screen TV watching ESPN all day. He just wasn't doing that. Uh, he was out preaching the gospel. Somebody was going, I didn't know you could even do it in those days. Uh, See, so he was out preaching the gospel, uh, and he was suffering as a result of, for it. So he's a seasoned guy uh, at this point, uh, and Barnabas is willing to go down and find him uh, and bring him back. Uh, the other thing that we see uh, about this is uh, incredible about Barnabas himself uh, in all of this is that he's the guy that comes from Jerusalem. He sees what God's doing. He is the church's representative there. We call him maybe the senior pastor over a large and a growing uh, and dynamic church. Uh, and he says to himself, there's got to be somebody better than me. There's got to be somebody that can do this better than me. I brought it this far, I'm going to go get Saul of Tarsus because that guy's a former Pharisee. He knows the word of God, uh, and I know him, and I've heard him preach, and I've heard him teach. He's exactly what this church needs. I'm going to go get him, and I'm going to allow him to increase while I decrease. 
something that John the Baptist said about Jesus Christ. Uh, again, just uh, the character of Barnabas is, uh, is amazing. We find other men like him uh, in the Bible, certainly. I think of Nehemiah, who uh, goes back and establishes uh, the walls there in Jerusalem uh, once, once again, as you know the story. Uh, but at a juncture in time, uh, as the governor of that city, the person who ran the city, uh, he is able to step aside and build a platform, get men like Ezra and others up there who can simply read uh, and then explain the scriptures to the people because he recognized that uh, uh, that's what they needed the most. He wasn't the one to be able to deliver it to him, but he could make it happen. He didn't mind stepping in the shadows and in, uh, and in the background. That's what we call the Jesus style. We've been teaching the kids on, uh, on Friday night uh, in, in the youth group. Uh, the person that is self-effacing and self-sacrificing does something for uh, the good of others. Uh, it used to be what we called in this country character. Uh, but uh, again, uh, we've lost those concept, concepts that we've gone more into a, a myoptic view. It's uh, all about me, myself, and what I can do for myself. And the world evolves around myself. I don't know if you've ever met this kind of people. Uh, they, it's hard for them to, to get through a door. It's not because their head's too big. It's because the, all the planets, you know, because the universe is evolving <laughs> around them. <laughs> They're driving on the roads out there as well. I just wanted to warn you of that. Is anyone paying attention here? Do I, you know, is this car really that invisible? Okay. But uh, we've kind of lost uh, the, the men like Barnabas. Uh, men and women that we need to become ourselves. Uh, again, the turning point includes uh, also uh, the new name that comes to this group of believers. Again, a hybrid name, as we said, uh, to identify them, uh, probably in a mocking sense uh, as being followers of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And um, uh, again, my, I think my last Calvary Chapel illustration for the day but uh, another one of Pastor Chuck. But uh, early on when they uh, got the church built and later established the school, Maranatha Academy, uh, they kind of, like a lot of, a lot of you know, small Christian schools, as they kind of grow along, you try to add you know, sports and some competition for the kids and so forth. And they, they had a few of those. Uh, and they added a wrestling team. Uh, but what was happening is that, well, they weren't very successful uh, in their uh, wrestling endeavor. Uh, and they began to be mocked as the church boys, uh, as the uh, uh, men's re boys wrestling team would compete with, uh, you know, big public high schools. And, uh, and I guess I can relate to the story a, a bit because I, I coached uh, boys volleyball for a small Christian school. And, and it wasn't always easy when we'd go out and play the, the bigger public schools and so forth. And uh, uh, so I could kind of relate to the story and appreciate it. So uh, they were being mocked by being called the church boys. Uh, well, somebody mentioned that to Pastor Chuck. Uh, he didn't like that. So he went out and found uh, the best guy he could, a former Olympic wrestler who was now coaching and uh, was a believer and brought him in to coach the kids. What do you need? You know, I need a bigger space. You got it. <laughs> yeah, we need some weights over here. You got it. Anyway, and, uh, and again, without ever uh, uh, recruiting a person to come to that school, this coach said, we don't need that. Wrestling is, a, is about uh, determination more than anything else. Uh, and he began to work with these guys. And they went on and won several state, state not a little Christian school conference, but the state of California. They won several state uh, wrestling championships. And now kids from other schools are trying to get into school to get in the wrestling program. They said, no, thank you. Uh, you know, we'll just, we want kids that want to come here and uh, know about the Lord and walk with the Lord and be part of the church. We'll make them wrestlers. We don't, we don't need to import any uh, any any wrestlers. One time there was an investigation by other high schools in the state of California because they said they're bringing kids from all over. That's uh, from uh, and kind of cherry picking from all the other teams. That's why they're so good. No, that wasn't why they were good. And by the way, what did they put on their sweatshirts as they went for competition? The church boys. <laughs> put it on their bags and everything. That's who they were. You want to call us church boys? We thank the Lord. We're from a church. It's, uh, you know, that's what was happening here. I mean, it, it was meant to be a derogatory thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, and again, we've kind of lost the meaning. There's a lot of people that use the term Christian. There's a lot of people walk around with jewelry of a cross on their neck that have no idea of its, uh, uh, of its meaning or a tattoo or whatever. But uh, it really meant something in, uh, uh, in those days. I can tell you being, <clears throat> being in India a couple of times with the guys for uh, Gospel for Asia, 
who undergo all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of persecution and, and beatings uh, uh, and so forth. And what they go f through for the sake of the gospel uh, is, uh, is amazing. And when those guys, uh, and they do re refer to uh, me as a brother in the Lord while I'm there, man, that's like, that's like an honor. I always feel like Barney Fife of the ministry, you know, when I'm there with these guys because uh, I feel like they, they tower over me in terms of uh, faith and, uh, and commitment to Christ. So when somebody like that calls you brother, it, uh, it really means something, uh, and it meant something to them uh, during the first century. Uh, the fourth aspect of this is uh, verse 20 to 30, uh, 27 to 30, a prophet predicts the, the need to show love to others. Uh, and in th these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that where there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, uh, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Uh, this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas uh, and Saul. So we'd say first that the prophet uh, Agabus again predicts uh, that there's going to be a famine, and uh, we know historically that this took place. Four famines during the reign of Claudius, uh, during about, uh, about, the, about the third time it happened, there was riots in the streets of, uh, of Rome wanting to kill the guy, uh, <laughs> believing that he hadn't really taken care of the Roman Empire and provided for them, uh, otherwise this wouldn't have happened. Two of these famines affected uh, Judea. Uh, they took place between 41 and 54 uh, AD. Uh, therefore, we can kind of pinpoint uh, Paul and Barnabas making their trip uh, back to Jerusalem with this offering at around 45 uh, AD. Uh, we just uh, mentioned that date to say that it had been a while, probably 10 years, and now these two guys are, are headed back with this, uh, with this offering. And you can imagine... Uh, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, uh, going back to Jerusalem, uh, but now he's Paul the Apostle, and uh, what, a, what a difference in his life, and we wonder about the reception that he would have received now uh, from the, uh, the brethren and the apostles there. Secondly, uh, the response certainly is uh, important, a response to the prediction, uh, and, uh, and again, this is, uh, uh, has to be seen in context. You have the first ever group uh, of uh, Gentiles and Jews worshiping together. It's never, never happened before. It's a very unique situation. Uh, the church back in Jerusalem is still 100% Jewish, and there had to be a few of them that were <laughs> more than a little put off, more than a little concerned about what was going on. Yeah, Barnabas is a good guy, but uh, man, I'm just, I'm just not too sure about this. And now they're hurting, uh, and, uh, and there's a famine, and that means... That means there's not enough food. <laughs> and there's not enough food for your kids. Uh, and, uh, and now an offering shows up from this church that's made up of Jews and Gentiles. Why? Because they're brothers and sisters in Christ and they care about you and love you and they wanted you to know that. This, this, this goes a long ways to uh, uniting the, uh, the body of Christ. Uh, and it's not over yet. That's why by the time we get to Acts 15, there's still a big discussion as to what to do uh, about these Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. But what a wonderful thing to show their love uh, one to another. Uh, again, huge turning point in the church. Uh, they become the missionary and mission sending church, which basically changes the world uh, as, as we know it. It's a new church. Uh, it's a new name. We'd say it's a, it's a new day uh, for Christianity here in the book of Acts. Just to close with one, one other story, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, of course, conquers the world by the time he's age uh, 23, uh, has a horrific influence over, over the nation of Israel, religious life, of course, at that time, uh, really uh, impacting the lives of the uh, uh, Pharisees and others, and, uh, and uh, it's hard to even uh, uh, estimate enough his influence uh, in the, the Greek thinking world uh, and what it did to Judaism uh, prior to Jesus Christ and his birth. Uh, in the first century. In his uh, uh, older age, uh, this story uh, comes that says that uh, there was someone among his ranks, a young man that had been named after him. Uh, the problem was that the young man was known to be a coward in battle. And so Alexander, of course, didn't like that, called the men before him and just point blank asked him, were you named after me? He says, yes, I was. I was named after you. 
He says, well, uh, I want you to do something. I either want you to learn to be brave or change your name. Because uh, he didn't want that reflection upon him. Uh, we are called Christians after Christ. He never threatens to have our name changed. Stop calling yourselves Christians. I, I don't know. Maybe he might say that sometimes. But uh, uh, it should be a concern. Uh, we carry the name, but do we really represent uh, Jesus Christ? Certainly we want to. Uh, we want to be men and women like these who just wherever they went shared out of the natural overflow of their hearts of what God was doing uh, in and through their lives. So let's pray. Let's pray.
Drown on 